Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. How many of you feel like that this morning? Amen. Spirit of singing. Yes. Even though our numbers are a little bit less. The first time I heard that song was in uh, was in England at the church that my son and daughter-in-law go to. It just blessed me then, it blesses me this morning. I had in my date book that today was the Sanctity of Life Sunday. And for those of you that uh, keep track of such things, you realize that I was incorrect. <laughs> Last week was the Sanctity of Life Sunday. And I didn't realize it until it was too late. Friday before, uh, Friday at the end of the week, too late to change sermons. So for us today, it's Sanctity of Life Sunday. <laughs> right, wrong, or different. In our pause between Nehemiah and our next adventure, which will be the book of Romans, by the way, I'd like to speak to some of the issues regarding sanctity of life in South Dakota. I believe we need to see things in their context. I don't want to be the person who can't see the forest for the trees, especially being having a forestry background, that's not a good thing. <laughs> and in order to have a proper understanding of things, we need the context. And without it, we'll not understand where the real issues lie and what the effectual response might be. So this morning, I'd like to define the context of the issues dominating the Sanctity of Life discussion in South Dakota. And in doing so, perhaps map out a more comprehensive strategy and response. Let's pray. Lord, our forefathers knew that life was sacred. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created <coughs> equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, namely life. We know that life comes from you, both physical and spiritual, and it's sacred, and we thank you for it. You've said in your word, you've knitted me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Before I was formed in the womb, you knew me. I pray, Father, this morning that you'd help us to grow in maturity, even to grow in maturity into Christ. Help us not to be babes, Lord, anymore. I pray, Father, that you'd raise up in our midst warriors that could speak into the face of this issue. Teach us this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There are people whose ideas take on a life of their own. They speak beyond the grave. One such person is Reverend Thomas Malthus. Malthus authored the Malthusian Population Theory. You may think you do not know it, but you know it. The premise of the theory is that we're headed for a worldwide population crisis. The food supply <coughs> grows at a linear rate but the population grows at an exponential rate. And therefore, the population is headed for a collapse due to a food shortage. Of course, Mal Reverend Malthus died in 1834. So far, we've been plugging along. His uh, solution was to alter reproduction. And of course, that solution has found numerous revisions embracing far more draconian measures. 
Paul Ehrlich wrote a book, some of you may have read it, The Population Time Bomb. Anybody ever read that? It was a must read for us uh, environmentalists in the 70s and 80s. The whole notion of over overpopulation was then and is now deeply, deeply embraced by environmental groups of all sorts. You'll hear it everywhere. Overpopulation, too many people. Reverend Thomas Malthus. Another person whose ideas have gone beyond his grave is Sir Francis Gall. He coined the term eugenics. You is a, it's a combination of Greek words, you meaning good, and gen meaning race, the good race, a better race. He said, therefore, it is possible to breed people to eliminate the undesirables and multiply the desirables. <coughs> There's two ways to approach eugenics, both from a positive standpoint and from a negative standpoint. He was influenced by his grandfather, interestingly enough, Erasmus Darwin. He and Charles Darwin were cousins. Sir Francis Galton was a proponent of positive eugenics, much the same idea as breed development in dogs and livestock. Negative eugenics would involve the same idea as culling those same livestock populations. Eugenics was a very popular movement in the United States prior or in the in post World One World War One America. You may not know this. The Buck versus Bell Supreme Court decision in 1927 made eugenics, made eugenic sterilizations legal in the United States. Altogether, there were about 60,000 sterilizations by 1950, with or without the consent of the patient. 27 states participated in this including South Dakota. The bulk of the eugenics work was done in California. About two-thirds of all the sterilizations that happened happened in California. The U.S. approach to eugenics had an ardent European admirer. Anybody know who that was? That's right. 1933. Adolf Hitler rose to power. He took eugenics, notably negative eugenics, to a whole new level. And as a result, six million Jews were murdered in concentration camps. And those concentration camps also commonly housed eugenics labs of which another 1,300 documented deaths were recorded. And you know the rest of the story regarding Adolf Hitler. Another person whose ideas live well behind her grave is Margaret Sanger. She was a Malthusian eugenics adherent, also a nurse taken by the plight of poor women in unwanted pregnancies. She saw the dark and seamy side that she thought was abortion. <coughs> she was an advocate of birth control, and interestingly, an opponent of abortion. Her organization, the National Organization for Birth Control, attracted financing from the wealthy elite in America, especially after World War I, or World War II. And that organization became Planned Parenthood, a firmly entrenched, government-funded institution that we have with us today. Margaret Sanger is revered today as the founder of the Women's Liberation Movement. Revered. Died in 1966. 
One good thing that Hitler did was expose eugenics for the evil that it really is. He gave <coughs> eugenics a really, really bad name. And as a consequence, eugenics kind of went underground at that point in time. They call it crypto-eugenics today. The wealthy elite that have continued to embrace the idea of eugenics have had to do it kind of in the background. And these wealthy elite funnel their resources to other movements and organizations that further the eugenics agenda, while at the same time accomplish other objectives. 1973 was a pivotal year for the abortion movement. Roe versus Wade struck down all the state laws that made abortion a felony offense. There was a, another decision that happened at the same time, Dole versus Bolton, that made abortions on demand legal through all nine months of a woman's pregnancy. 55 million abortions as a result. A nice accomplishment as far as Malthusians are concerned. And being that African American women are six times more likely to choose to abort their babies as white women, the proponents of eugenics are delighted also. <coughs> And in the tradition of Nehemiah, oh, excuse me. and then the tradition of Nehemiah, lest time obscure the names of those who steered us down this murderous path. Here they are: Warren Burger, William O. Douglas, William Brennan Jr., Potter Stewart, Thurgood Marshall, Harry Blackman, Lewis Powell. May their names never be forgotten. Byron White and William Rehnquist voted no in that decision. By the way. So here we have a system of beliefs, a worldview, if you will, that currently expresses themselves in the tragedy of abortion. Eugenics has gone underground. I say crypto eugenics. But the elitists that here, adhere to it are still a big funding source and advocate for Planned Parenthood, for one, and in the defense of abortion rights. There's never a shortage of money when it comes to pursuing those things. I've added one more expression of this same belief system, and we've begun to dabble in it to some extent hasn't gone real far yet, euthanasia. And you've all been familiar with the big news of the past year. Here's one more that'll be supported in the same way. And it'll be another way to accomplish the same goals. I suspect that government-controlled health care will be used to pursue the goal of negative eugenics, the removal of undesirables from the population by withholding health care. Look for that. You'll be seeing that. Government-controlled health care is ripe with opportunities for social manipulation of the masses by the elite. Just a short history of abortion, abortion law in South Dakota. The state has not been silent or still during this whole process. Way back as far as 1980, the legislature approved a law requiring a 24-hour waiting period to have an abortion. 1997, parental notification was required. Also, partial birth abortion was banned. In 2000, only doctors can perform abortions. 
2004 became an activist year for the legislature. They passed a bill to ban abortions, which was vetoed by Governor Janklow at the time for reasons that he didn't feel it would stand constitutional muster. So in 2006, House Bill 1215 passed going through those kind of revisions that Janklow wanted. It was passed by a courageous legislature, but it was referred. And it lost in the referral by 56 to 44 percent. In 2008, Initiated Measure 11 got on the ballot. There was a, a drive for pastors to collect signatures for the initiated measure. They ended up with twice as many signatures as they needed to put it on the ballot. But that also lost 553 to 44.7%. Those referrals, I believe, were turned back by South Dakota voters because they were willing to be persuaded by big out-of-state advertising. Big money ruled the day. So I've given you the context of the world view of abortion in South Dakota and in this country. You can see that it's a, it's a world view. It is, doesn't just stand by itself. People don't make these choices just out of the blue. Sure, there's other things that come into it, but these are the world views that have financed and developed this whole thing. And it's a world view that's solidly entrenched in this country. What can I do? What can the common person do in the social situation that we find ourselves in? First of all, recognize the need for discipleship. Both your own and for others. You don't send babes out into a battle like this. They don't, they can't handle it. Capable, people capable of contending for the truth in an arena like this one must be mature warriors, not babes. Yet, how do we find ourselves? For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who, who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Don't be content by being a babe. Find ways of becoming disciple. Find someone that can help you be disciplined so that you can be of service here. We see the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto Him who is the head, even Christ. And what are the doctrines that have tossed us about? Malthusian population theory and eugenics. It's revealing that when Harry Blackman wrote the majority opinion for Roe versus Wade, he repeatedly referenced the writings of extreme eugenicists. He quoted from abortion by Lawrence Later seven times. Later was a member of the British Eugenics Society. He quoted from Population Time Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. 
And he quoted from state abortion decisions based on eugenics theory. The one article that I was reading said it might as well have been written by the eugenicists themselves. This is a worldview totally alien from the Christian worldview of life. And yet it has tossed us about on mercy. Still tosses us about today. Ephesians tells us to grow up, get disciple, and when you get out of the baby stage, disciple others. You don't send children into a battle like this, you only send warriors. Which brings me to my second point. Engage. Engage in the battle. Don't stand on the sidelines and don't run away. The enemy has an entrenched worldview that rears its ugly head against the knowledge of God. Engage him wherever you find him. But engage. Learn to speak truth into the face of that worldview. It's ugly, and it stands against the knowledge of God. And remember, this is the nature of the battle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness <coughs> in heavenly paces. And this is how the victory will be won. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And what are the weapons of our warfare? It's the truth. The truth of God. He gives it to us right here. And he just asks us to use it. Use it, and use it, and use it. Third, be an active voice for life. How do I do that? We have a great crisis pregnancy center in Rapid City. Volunteer. Get training. Give of your time. Help them financially. They depend on contributions to run their, um, what do you call that? Ultrasound. Ultrasound system. That's how it's financed. They have a nurse, an, an ultrasound practitioner, but they depend upon giving in order to keep her going. Children are in great need in South Dakota. We have two of them sitting right here. There are not enough foster care and adoptive families. <clears throat> Some of you could do this. Get training. Take these kids in and love them and speak truth to them. Give them a family. Give of your home. Write letters to the editor. Give of your voice. And finally, don't forget to embrace those that have been scarred by this scourge of abortion. Help them to see and understand true repentance. And help them to restoration. Give of your forgiveness. And tell them of God's forgiveness. This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father. To visit the orphan and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself unstained by the world. I'm telling you. You will want to be able to tell Jesus that you did this. When you stand before Him. And you will stand before Him. 
Amen. James goes on to say, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And fourthly, be supportive of godly legislators, both here in South Dakota and in Washington. We have them. Encourage them to hang in there. Pray for them. Get to know them. Send them notes of encouragement. Send them emails of encouragement. They've been bloodied and betrayed in South Dakota. But help them to stand. Remember heroes of old, like William Wilberforce. He spoke to the issue of slavery for 20 long years. 20 years of mockery and derision. But finally, the scourge was broken. Jesus speaks for life. The thief comes only to kill. Ours is a bloody, murderous generation. Killing Field is a mass grave containing the corpses of 55 million children. And they'll be joined by many others as this evil worldview prevails. Every follower of Christ is accountable to do something. We're going to sing our last song. I'm not sure who's going to lead it. <laughs> Our benediction comes from the book of Proverbs. Deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are struggling, staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this, does not he who consider it weigh the hearts? And does not he who know it keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his word?